Good morning to everyone and thanks for inviting me. What the organizer asked me to do today is just try to think about genocide as a social process, to understand what is, what is the social practice of genocide and what different stages are in a genocidal social process as a way to have some tools to analyze later the situation in, Bur in Burma during the last 30, 40 years and to analyze the different possibilities to confront those acts. So the, ter the term genocide was, was coined by the police jurist Raphael Lemkin, who wrote that by genocide we mean the destruction of a nation or ethnic group. But Lenkin went on to argue that genocide has two phases. One, the destruction of the national identity of the oppressed group, the idea of identity and the idea of oppression, and the other, the imposition of the national identity of the oppressor. That's the main understanding of genocide in Lemkin. It is a way to distract not only the people, but the identity of the people through a process of oppression and to, to replace the identity with the identity of the oppressor. So the distinctive feature of genocide, according to Lemkin, is that it aims to destroy a group rather than, in, than the individuals that make up the group. The ultimate purpose of genocide is to de destroy the group's identity and impose the new identity. And this idea gives us a useful insight into the workings of power systems in the modern era. In particular, the nation state has tended to destroy the identity of ethnic and religious minorities within its boundaries and impose a new identity on them. I would say that that is the core of genocide as a social practice. My contention is that modern genocide has been a deliberate attempt to change the identity of the survivors, even of the survivors, by modifying relationships within a given society. That is what sets modern genocide apart from earlier massacres of civilian populations, as well as from other processes of mass destruction. It is a process that starts long before and ends long after the actual physical annihilation of the victims. In the international legal arena, the Article 2 of the 1948 Genocide Convention defined genocide as any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, national, ethnical, racial, racial or religious groups as such, and five actions, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent birth within the group, and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. In addition to that legal definition, the concept of genocide as a social practice allows to adopt a broader and more flexible approach to the problems of causality and responsibility. It also helps to distinguish genocide from other social processes of mass destruction. Now, despite the obvious differences between law and social sciences, we should point out that it is organization, training, practice, legitimation, and consensus that distinguish genocide as a social practice from other more spontaneous or less intentional acts of killing and mass destruction. In addition, social practices are ongoing and under permanent construction. In many instances, the appropriateness of the term genocide has been questioned on the grounds that the process has not gone far enough to speak of full-blown genocide. But when does genocide actually begin? At what moment can we consider that the term is being correctly applied? Adopting the concept of genocidal social practices allows us to address a thorny methodological issue in history and the social sciences namely that of periodization, to understand the whole process of genocide. A sociological understanding of genocide as a modern social practice needs to take into account three interconnected processes, the construction, destruction, and reorganization of social relations. 
I will present a six-stage process of genocidal social practices, beginning at the moment that a group of individual is negatively constructed as other, and continuing until its symbolic extermination in the minds of the survivors, which may happen after the physical acts of extermination themselves. Not all the stages described are strictly sequential. In practice, there is often considerable overlap between the different stages, although each of those on the path to mass murder constitutes a necessary step in the process. The model emphasizes the negative ways in which the state brands those who think or behave differently in such diverse areas as sexuality, politics, religion, nation, the workplace, but also the fact that the extermination of those groups that lie outside the norm is a clear message to the population that no deviation from the norm will be tolerated. The ruthless efficiency of state punishment, reinforced by, by official rhetoric and allowing no exception, is designed to make the standardization of society seem inevitable. So the first stage is the stigmatization, the construction of negative otherness. The first step in destroying previously cooperative relations within or between social group is that stigmatization. In order to construct the negative other as, as a distinctive social category, those in power draw on symbols in the collective imagination, build new myths, and reinforce latent prejudices. Two groups are thus created, the majority or in-group, us, and a minority or out-group, them, that do not wish to be like everyone else and therefore do not deserve to exist. The second stage is harassment. This stage marks a qualitative leap from symbolic to physical violence. In general, it advances more quickly in times of crisis, as the latent violence resulting from current deprivations and uncertainty about the future can be directed against those who insist on maintaining a separate identity. Typically, the stigmatized group is accused of causing the crisis by corrupting public morals or being a threat for the national security or undermining national unity or conspiring with foreign agents in ways that wouldn't normally stand the test of common sense. Harassment is characterized by two types of simultaneous and complementary actions, bullying and disenfranchisement. First, radicals or shock troops carry out sporadic attacks claiming that their tolerance is at an end and calling for firm actions. These attacks achieve several goals simultaneously. They deepen the process of stigmatization, they test society's readiness to buy into physical violence, and they provide an excuse to recruit and organize a repressive apparatus to manage the situation. Second, the authorities gradually deprive the stigmatized group of its civil rights. The third stage is isolation. At this stage, the focus shifts to social and territorial planning. This stage has taken different forms at different moments in modern history, but the goal is always the same to demarcate a separate social, geographical, economic, political, or cultural, and even ideological space for those who are different, and at the same time to sever their social ties with the rest of society. That is why this third stage, it is the turning point between general processes in modern history and the path to genocide. The fourth stage is the policies of systematic awakening. At this stage, the perpetrators set priorities. They distinguish between those that must be extermination, exterminated and those that may be exterminated, depending on the political and social circumstances and the perpetrator's capacity to kill. Once the victims have been isolated from the rest of society, the perpetrators typically implement a series of measures aim at wakening them systematically. They consist of strategies of physical destruction through overcrowding, malnutrition, epidemics, lack of health care, torture, and sporadic killings, and of psychological destruction, 
manifested in humiliation, abuse, harassment, or killing of family members, attempts to undermine solidarity through collective punishment, the encouraging of collaboration in categorizing and classifying prisoners, and denunciation and peer abuse. And the first stage is the extermination. The extermination stage is characterized by the physical disappearance of those who once embodied certain types of social relations and or identities. But there is a, a last stage, the sixth stage, which I have called symbolic enactment. Because genocide social practices do not end in the physical annihilation of the victims, but rather in the symbolic ways that this annihilation is represented. If the overarching purpose of genocide is to transform social relationships within a given society, it is not sufficient to kill those who think or behave differently. The most effective form of symbolic genocide is not oblivion, which ignores the disappearance of a way of life as if it had never disappeared, but doesn't preclude its reappearance. The most effective form of symbolic genocide is the pious pretense that genocide is somehow irrational and inexplicable. There were killings, yes, but neither reasons nor identities in those killings. So it is non understandable what happens. There were killings, but why? That is not clear because someone is mad, probably. For genocide to be effective while the perpetrators are in power, it is not enough for the perpetrators to kill and materially eliminate those who stand for a particular social order the perpetrator wish to destroy, or a particular identity. They need to spread the terror caused by genocide throughout society. Conversely, the best way to perpetuate the effects of terror in a post-genocidal society is by dissociating genocide from the social order in which it occurred. Not in a crude and obvious way by denying the facts, but by changing the meaning, logic, and intentionality of these facts. The six stages of modern genocide describe above form a cycle, the central aim of which is to transform the society in which genocide takes place by destroying a way of life and reorganizing social relations. The disappearance of a memory of the victims brought about by symbolic enactment that is, by the enactment of genocide through discursive and other symbolic means, is an attempt to close the cycle. Not only do the victims no longer exist, but they allegedly never existed. This idea that this identity, and I think that's interesting for the current discourses about that there were never Rohingya in the region. It is not an identity, even if the process is not concluded. So I hope these sociological tools could be perhaps useful to understand and confront genocidal social practices and to be some tools to analyze the things will be analyzed here. So thank you very much. Thank you.